explain that to you, but uh, I don't know. You could ask me at the coffee break or something. Now, that's uh, a number that's sort of, ah, I'm trying to find my slide changer and failing. Um, we could just not change the slides. Um, that's surprising. All right, well, be it. Oh, this was part of it. Um, oh, what do you know? It's in there somewhere. OK, here we go. Um, yeah, so, so that's um, a number that has to do with the FCC uh, incentive auction, the upcoming spectrum auctions, or ongoing spectrum auctions. Um, I was telling Amos about this at a coffee break. And this is a sort of intermediate amount of money that the uh, US government has procured the right to buy a bunch of spectrum for, which is unlikely to end up being the amount of money that they actually have to pay. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you that story as we get to that part of the talk after the break. But uh, there, there's a little teaser, OK. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about trying to understand the empirical hardness of NP-complete problems. I guess I'll, I'll begin by trying to give you some sense of what I might mean by uh, those kind of strange terms. Um, l let me at the outset just uh, mention that this talk is going to be surveying a whole lot of different uh, papers over a period of about 15 years, uh, particularly with these uh, collaborators here. Holger Hoos, who's another professor at UBC and is a close collaborator of mine, um, Frank Hutter, who's a former um, PhD student and postdoc, now a professor in Germany. Eugene Noodleman, who was a, a fellow PhD student at Stanford, saw the error of his ways and went to Google. Um, Joachim Shoham, who's my advisor at Stanford, saw the error of ways, went to Google, went to Stanford, went to Google, went to Stanford, now he's in Israel. Um, and Lin Shu, who's a, uh, a former PhD student. Um, I'll just sort of throw out block citations at the beginnings of sections and, and not really call attention to individual papers. But of course, everything's a collaboration. Um, and, and at the outset, let me point out that uh, th this talk is really going to be uh, a bit different from the others that you've seen in the boot camp. Uh, you can guess which one of these I am. Um, so, so the uh, empty seats here either reflect other people, not you, who knew this and, and wisely stayed away, or people who are still eating. We'll find out as time goes on. Um, but uh, the, the way that this is going to be really different is that the, this talk is not really going to have theorems in it. Um, I, I don't think the theor a theorem statement even appears anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, but, but let me give just a moment for, for people who might realize they left something in their office to uh, duck out. Um, instead, it's, it's really going to uh, have a bunch of graphs, even worse. Um, I, I'm really going to be thinking about kind of empirical uh, ways of thinking about the kinds of questions that I think people here are very interested in and think about theoretically. Um, at the beginning of this talk, I'm going to try to persuade you that nevertheless you should care about this, after which we can have a 30 second break and see what happens. Uh, because um, much of this is going to be uh, methodologically pretty different from uh, what I imagine many of you are used to, let me especially stress to you that I, I welcome your interruptions and questions throughout the talk. I think it'll be more fun for all of us if you guys just feel free to jump in, uh, as indeed some of you already have felt free. Good for you. Um, but, but yeah, please uh, jump in. Um, and uh, let, let me mention that you know, as strange as this all is, uh, lo look at us right here in the description of the, the workshop. I was looking at it yesterday. Like, wow, th this actually makes sense. And so what I'm really going to be talking about, particularly in the first half of the talk, is alternatives to worst case analysis of algorithms using ideas from machine learning. Couldn't have said it better myself. 
So, so that's what we're going to begin by thinking about. Um, so going to an algorithms textbook, you, you know, so something that gets thrown around a lot is people say NP-complete problems are intractable. So, so I tried to go look at an algorithms textbook and get a, a crisp definition of what people actually mean by intractable. And it, this was sort of the punchiest definition that I can find. Problems are intractable when they can be solved, but not fast enough for the solution to be usable. Um, well, strictly speaking, it's not really right to say that this is the case of NP-complete problems, because um, the, the reality is, is a lot more complicated about that. Of course, that's, that's true in the worst case, uh, unless you know, deep theoretical uh, results get proven that make all of us very happy and make somebody a million dollars. Um, but uh, the state of the art today is that there exist methods for solving NP-complete problems which offer typically no interesting theoretical guarantees at all, but they work ridiculously well in practice, probably much better than many of you might be aware. Um, and they typically exhibit kind of exponentially varying performance, by which I mean very often they're very, very fast, even on enormous, enormous instances, um, you know, milliseconds or seconds to, to run on really big instances where you know, often the, the solving time is dominated by reading in this enormous instance. But then occasionally on problems from the same distribution and of the same size, they take really long amounts of time. Uh, and then everything in between as well. So, you know, much of the time in practice, we can just kind of ignore worst case complexity theory and just proceed onwards anyway and do really well. But then once in a while, uh, things are really terrible. And so um, a question that I've been really animated by in my own work is trying to understand how hard is it to solve a given problem in practice using the best available methods. And this is a question that you, know, you would sort of hope as a practitioner to turn to complexity theory to get an answer to. And if what you're interested in is NP-complete problems, you'd be pretty disappointed by the kinds of advice that complexity theory can give you about the solving problems in practice using the best available methods. It's not to say that complexity theory has absolutely nothing to say, but it has very little to say about the really complex algorithms that we use in practice that, that exhibit good performance. And I guess I, I hope to learn uh, at this uh, semester uh, from some of you about the, the cutting state of the art of uh, what, um, what is known about complexity theory. But I think it's still pretty safe to say that there's, there's a pretty giant gap between what's known and what we're able to do in practice. So here's kind of the main message of this talk. Um, even in settings which are sort of as bad as you could imagine um, things getting from a, a formal analysis point of view, where algorithms are complex black boxes. You know, I might think about something like Cplex, which is you know, an astoundingly fast commercial solver for mixed integer programming. And it's not just that it's really, really hard to analyze because it's so enormously complex, but in fact, it's a trade secret. They don't even tell you how it works. You know, if you go at a conference and you talk to the people who work for Cplex, they sort of snicker and they tell you they won't tell you how their algorithm works. So you, you really don't know how this thing works. Um, and, and when you have an instance distribution, which is somehow richly structured, it's not a uniform distribution over something, but it's some you know, actual distribution that, that arises in a practical application area of interest. Um, even in settings like this, it's possible to, to say something meaningful about how algorithms perform um, in a kind of generalizable way that we can learn something from. And, and the key idea here is to use rigorous statistical methods rather than kind of combinatorial analytic methods that, that probably are, are closer to the hearts of most of the people here. Um, I, I suspect that uh, this kind of math is probably less exciting to many people here, less, less in your wheelhouse. Here's, even if that's true, why I think you should care about this. Um, because even if you think, as I guess I would agree, that this kind of you know, analytic, um, worst case, proving a theorem kind of approach is, is more satisfying, it's more bulletproof, the success of statistical methods it demonstrates the existence of patterns that we don't yet understand. And so you can really use these statistical methods to find uh, regularities in the ways that algorithms behave. And, and then you know, these are really actionable, um, you know, robust, generalizable claims that I think can be a great starting point for uh, theoretical analysis. So you can kind of think of many of the methods that I'm going to be speaking about, particularly in the first half of the talk today, as kind of 
open problem generators that you can use to, to think about what might be going on in a family of problems. And then maybe that can give you a starting point for some theory. And, and just to uh, sort of whet your appetite, there's one point in the talk where I'll, I'll dive deep into uh, how one of the, the findings that we have works, just to give you a sense of what this sort of open problem generator approach might look like. So this is not a talk about SAT. Uh, this is really a talk about the methods that um, we use sort of statistically to reason about sort of beyond worst case uh, complexity of hard problems, particularly NP-complete problems. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to speak most but not quite all the time about satisfiability because empirically it's a really widely studied problem. So this is a place where the instance distributions have been thought about very carefully. A wide range of high performance solvers that are different from each other have over a long period of time been kind of evolved by the community. So this is sort of the fruit fly of empirical algorithmics. This is just the, the, the sort of test bed that everybody comes to, to to make sure that some idea that they have really holds up. Uh, and so for that reason, it's sort of the most responsible thing for me to, to look at SAT for, um, for the kinds of things that I want to say to you. Um, but but I, I, as I start you know, going on and on about SAT, I, I hope that at the coffee break you don't say, oh, that guy was giving a talk about SAT, uh, because really uh, very little that I say is, is going to be really particular to the, the domain. Uh, but of course, because it's empirical, I'm going to be speaking about a domain. So I want to begin by talking about this phenomenon that probably many of you have heard about of phase transitions in satisfiability. And despite my claims to the contrary, this is a point where I'm going to be speaking about a uniform random distribution of instances. Uh, you'll notice in my sort of outline thing at the top here, I'm going to begin for a while speaking about uniform random 3SAT, and then I'll, I'll go beyond that to other uh, distributions in SAT uh, before, probably after the break, speaking about applications. And, uh, the, the reason I care about uniform random 3SAT is not because I claim that it's uh, a practical really in any way. It's actually pretty artificial. Uh, but rather because th we understand maybe some of the best here about what, what happens on average um, and, and how that correlates with the performance of strong solvers. And it's, it's a problem that people have really studied to death. So if it's possible to say something new here, there, there's really a, a chance that, that one is really saying something new. Uh, so let me tell you about this phase transition. So you guys have probably heard about this fact that there's a, a phase transition in the probability of solvability at a clauses to variables ratio of about 4.26. So, so let me show you this with a graph that's based on real data. So here I'm showing you um, we generated a bunch of SAT problems. I think these were with uh, 500 variables and the appropriate number of clauses. Um, and so. Um, then we varied the, the ratio of clauses to variables in, uh, in generating these uh, various different problems. And we looked at what fraction of those problems were satisfiable. Um, so, so this is a size that we can solve all of them using modern SAT solvers. This is getting close to what we can't solve, but, but this we can solve. Uh, and you see what happens is when the clauses to variables ratio is pretty low, which means you have relatively few clauses to the number of variables. Clauses amount to constraints. So you have relatively many variables, relatively few constraints. Then um, the chances that you can uh, find a satisfying assignment for this problem are, are basically one. And you know, this is because the problem is under constrained. There are lots and lots of solutions. There are lots of ways that you can solve the problem. So intuitively, you would expect that up here, the, the answer would be one. And for the same kind of. Uh, sort of opposite reason, you would expect over here that it would be 0. Because uh, when we get enough clauses, then your problem is over constrained. There are lots of reasons why your problem can't be satisfied. Even if you were to drop a few clauses, you still wouldn't be able to satisfy it. You know, all the solutions are ruled out by sort of <coughs> multiple clauses. And so, so kind of intuition would tell you that you, know, you should have a region of 1s here, and you should have a region of zeros here. What's interesting, though, is that the transition from the region of 1s to the region of zeros comes really sharply. It comes as a phase transition. And in fact, this uh, transition gets sharper and sharper as you have more and more variables. So here I'm showing you know, empirical results for a sort of moderate number of variables. So you can still see a bit of a slope here. But as it gets bigger and bigger, we know theoretically it gets sharper and sharper. So, so far, this is not anything to do with algorithms for solving SAT. This is just a property of uniform random generation of SAT instances. Uh, here's, um, though, something uh, about heuristic algorithms. So this is a graph of the log runtime of a, a relatively strong, um, at the time we generated the graph, one of the stronger um, solvers for solving uniform random 3SAT problems. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, it goes from uh, being very easy, this is log runtime, so really, really easy, to quite hard to easier. 
um, as, as we come to this phase transition point. And in particular, there's a spike in hardness right at this phase transition point. It's really robust across different solvers that the hardest uniform random three set problems are those ones that live at exactly the phase transition. Just for that 4.26, I think theoretically it is not proof. Theoretically, I think this 3.2.4 or something like this. People say 4.3, but that's, that's because they're rounding off. Sorry, I, I think that, that really is, uh, I think that there's some kind of formula for it, and people have, over time, sort no, of I think gotten it. Uh, 24, I think that's the one that we had it. Then for general K, I mean, there are. You think it's 3.24? I think that's the best that um, probably you can do that. I'm not checking. Well, I, I think, yeah, there's a whole literature on this that I, I've sort of periodically looked at. I actually can't, can't claim to be expert on it, but there, there are known kind of upper bounds and lower bounds on, on what this transition is, yeah. and you, you might be giving a lower bound. The lower bound, yeah. yeah. The lower bound. Uh, but, but then I think there, there's, uh, there's some other approach that, that tries to estimate where, where the actual threshold is. And I, I think the best current estimate is something like 4.26. But, I think but that's it's possible that's only where it's coming from. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, I think it's not hard to see in the data that it's not 3.4. You know, really, it isn't. Um, yeah, I think the algorithm that can satisfy the lower bound is, I think, 3.2.4. That's possible. Let, let's, let's talk about this afterwards, because that really won't play a role in what I want to say going forward. Um, what, what, what I want to say just is notice here that we've related something about the instance to something about the empirical performance, not of kind of clean algorithms that we can understand really, really deeply, but of messy state-of-the-art algorithms that perform as well as any algorithms that we can find. Uh, I think this is sort of the, the cleanest and, and maybe the earliest example I know of of a relationship um, between some kind of general set of hard problems and sort of every good algorithm that's known out there rather than some toy algorithm that, that sort of is a, is a tool for analysis. And this, this spawned, a, I think, a, an enthusiasm for using empirical methods to study this kind of algorithm performance. Um, now, let me, so, so this was, was real data about KCNFs. Let me show you uh, the actual data that was underneath this real data that I showed you. So, so it turns out this line here, what, you know, what does this line actually represent? It represents the mean at every one of these points. So let me not show you the mean. Let me show you the actual underlying data. And, and this is the underlying data. Um, this is a graph that probably um, many fewer theorists have seen before. And you know, th this shows that that story that I told you before is, is much messier than you might have thought, because there's an awful, you know, pick any kind of vertical slice here. This is the amount of runtime variation that you have at any point as you vary the closest to variables ratio. And you know, I put here a dotted line at the phase transition region, which is the hard region. And you can see that here at the phase transition region, we have problems that are taking well under a tenth of a second. And we have other problems that are taking sort of as much time as anything does. And you know, overall, there's, there's a bigger clump of these problems up here, so the mean is, is large. Um, but uh, you know, isn't that kind of surprising? Uh, by the way, you, you might see other graphs like this. So let me mention to you, why, why is there this banding here? Uh, that's just uh, the resolution of the CPU timer, because it's on a log scale. It, it blows out these small numbers. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, uh, you shouldn't be worried that something fishy is going on here. Um, so. Uh, so, so this shows that there, there's more going on, that as, as much as this clauses to variables ratio had something interesting to tell us about you know, a structural property of the instance and the performance of kind of state-of-the-art solvers, we're certainly not explaining all of the variance. You know, clauses to variables ratio doesn't give me a way of knowing whether I've got this instance or whether I've got this instance. And I might wonder, is there something different about these two instances that, that causes them to have different performance? Well, one thing that I can condition on that, that is already pretty interesting is the satisfiability status of the instance, which is not something, of course, that I get to know before I run my solver, but it's nevertheless a, a structural property of the instance. And here is uh, the distribution conditioned only on satisfiability status. So you see that this big kind of fuzzy regime is, is the satisfiable instances, which is, uh, you know, and in contrast, these are the unsatisfiable instances, which are much more kind of homogeneously uh, grouped together. And, and that might not be surprising if you think about the fact that there, there's something fundamentally different in practice about proving satisfiability and proving unsatisfiability. You know, in this under-constrained region, there are many satisfying assignments, typically. And as soon as I find any one of them, I get to stop. And so I expect to see high variance runtimes in the satisfiable regime, because I don't know, it's something very particular about the algorithm, which of these things I'm going to find first. 
in the unsatisfiable case, I have to, I have to prove something about the whole formula. And, and regardless of which order I go through, I can maybe prune parts of my search space, but I still have to kind of reason about the whole search space. So I end up with much lower variation. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the solver returns a reputation of the formula? Um, yeah, it, it, it really the, the run of the solver sort of amounts to a proof. It doesn't return it because it can be exponential size, but it, uh, it, it does sort of certify that, that there's no solution. Um, Kevin? Yeah. Do you have any intuition as to why it slopes downward for the non-satisfiable instances? Why does it get easier? So why do these ones get easier? Yeah, I do have an intuition about that. And I guess that's, that's the kind of question I want to be thinking about throughout this talk. So, so great to be thinking about it now. Kind of in, intuitively, the, I think the intuition is that the search space gets smaller <coughs> because you, you, sort of, you keep throwing random constraints. And sort of think of, I mean, it's sort of a bad analogy, but you can sort of geometrically think of like random hyperplanes in a MIP problem or something. And you, you keep throwing them in, you know, they're going to bite more and more. You're going to have a smaller and smaller um, area to be searching. And, and furthermore, that area is going to be kind of more and more regular. It's going to be easier to reason about. And so as um, you get more and more constraints, you have to do sort of less searching to demonstrate that, that there's no solution that satisfies any of your constraints. And so kind of the intuition is that right here at the phase transition where the probability of satisfiability is 50%, you know, if there's a solution, there's probably only one solution. And if there's not a solution, then probably you know, dropping one constraint would have allowed you to have a solution, like you almost have a solution. And so that's the place where it's hardest to sort of demonstrate whichever thing it is. Uh, and you know, here it's just it's much easier to demonstrate it. But you still have to search the whole space, which is why you never kind of get down to this. There are multiple heuristics for solving the SAT, right? Yes. So does this graph look same across different heuristics? Or? Yes. Uh, broadly speaking, we see the same kind of pattern. Uh, among Here I'm looking at complete solvers for SAT that can prove unsat. Of course, there are local search solvers that can't prove unsat, and then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the second group of points because we couldn't prove unsat. Uh, but yeah, broadly speaking, among complete solvers, we see this pattern. And you have to take my word for it. I'm only showing it to you here for KCNFs. Um, but, but really, uh, this is what has made uh, empirical researchers really excited about this problem. Because as different as the different algorithms are, we end up still with this kind of pattern pretty robustly. Anybody else before I go on? So, so then the kind of state of things, you know, where we stand as, as we begin our story today, is that we know that the probability of solvability you know, correlates really strongly with instance um, hardness in practice. But when we dig a little deeper and look at the scatter plot, we can see that there's a lot of residual variance. There's other stuff going on, and we don't really know what that is. And you know, the question that animated our work is to ask, you know, is it possible to be more accurate than this? Is it possible to somehow you know, figure out what's driving some of that other variance? And you know, I guess there's, there's sort of multiple approaches one could take if one were you know, a really smart, mathematically minded person, then one might try to think about what's going on and prove a theorem. That might sound appealing to you, but it sounds far too difficult to me. So instead, what, what seemed appealing to me would, was to gather a whole lot of data and throw a machine learning algorithm at it and see if it could figure something out. Uh, and so this is something you know, we did back when I was in grad school, just sort of as a Hail Mary to see if something came of it. And, and we sort of stubbed our toe on something really interesting, because it turns out um, th this works a, a lot better than, than I, and I think a lot of people I've talked to over the years, thought that it should have. And I guess this talk is about sort of digging into the implications of that. So, so this is something we call empirical hardness models. Uh, and I'm going to begin by talking about these models um, in the context of this um, uniform random three set problem that I've been motivating with. And then, as I said before, we'll, we'll scope out after that. So th what we want to do with what I'm calling an empirical hardness model is to predict how long an algorithm will take to run um, on some distribution of problems of interest. And, as is typical in machine learning, the way I want to think about this distribution is I want to take a bunch of IID samples from the distribution. Um, and for each of these problem instances, each of these samples from the distribution, I'm going to measure some vector of feature values. And I'll have a little bit more to say about what these feature values are. But essentially, I want these to be things that are cheap to measure about the instance. I don't want them to sort of correspond to solving the instance, or I'd be begging the question. So I want to ask something sort of computationally non-demanding about the instance. Uh, and then furthermore, for all of these um, samples that I'm going to get to build my model from, I'm going to have an, a labeled observation, which is the runtime of whichever algorithm it is that I want to characterize running on that problem. And now I've just got a supervised machine learning problem. I've got a regression problem. And so I'd like to find some mapping 
that can be given a new instance from the distribution that I've never seen before. I can compute its, its inexpensive features, and then I can evaluate this learned mapping, and it'll give me a runtime without my ever running the algorithm. It'll give me some prediction of how long my algorithm would take to run on this new problem. Um, and then I could compare that by actually running the algorithm on that problem and see whether my, my learning algorithm works well or not. And, and if so, then I, I've found this model, this kind of analytic F that, that can be evaluated without running my algorithm. And that's going to sort of incorporate some sort of understanding, uh, some sort of theory about what drives the performance of my algorithm. Uh, and and we, can, we can do all the things that we know about from machine learning to make sure that this thing is robust, that it's making real predictions, to, to gain some kind of statistical confidence that, that we're not just kind of coming up with garbage here. Um, in, in the papers that we've written on this, we've spent a lot of time evaluating a variety of different machine learning methods and you know, various different sort of tweaks on the methodology. Should we log transform the response variable? How do we deal with censored observations? Uh, there, there are a lot of subtleties that I'm not going to get into, although I'd be happy to discuss them with uh, those of you who are interested. Um, th this choice makes a difference. And I guess at the end, um, when I get to this next section here, I'm going to give you a sense of what our very best methods are doing and how they contrast with simple methods. But I think the, the first order message that I want to convey to you is that th this works pretty decently, sort of no matter how sophisticated you are. So I, I want to begin by thinking about something really straightforward, um, which is uh, ridge regression. I'm going to, uh, it's basically linear regression with a small regularizer, uh, which we use mostly just for numerical stability. Um, and uh, basis function expansion, I'll be thinking about quadratic functions rather than linear functions in, the, in this first part. But that's it. So really, the uh, kind of regression you'd learn in a first stats class. Features are more uh, I, I'll speak about that in the, the next slide in some detail. But what I mean is we need to decide how to map from a problem instance to this finite length vector of, uh, of real numbers. And you know, depending on how I do that, you might say that that's doing a lot of the work. right? If you have terrible features that don't capture something important, then you've got nothing. So, you know, if I claim that this is working, you know, a big part of my claim must be that I've, I've made a good guess about what the feature should be. Um, so, so let's think about those features. So, so this is the place where I can say the least about the generality of what I have to tell you, because every time I, I go to some new problem domain, I need to think anew about features. It's not quite that bad, because I can go via reductions to SAT and leverage SAT features. That, that gives me something in a general sense. But maybe, not, maybe that wouldn't be the best. Um, how is it different from any other machine learning? Many other machine learning, you need to go from a real object to attributes, which is sort of. So now I know how to. We don't have any methodology. Well, I guess we have deep learning now, but yeah. No, even deep learning, you need okay. You need to like do encoding unary, like most of them do binary. How do you write things up? So, so this is like generic machine learning. Is there something specific here? No, no. I, I, you'll be very disappointed. There really isn't. It, An SVM or something or a deep learning. <laughs> No, no, not really. Um, I, I mean, I guess some, some concepts are learnable and some are not, right? So if I want to tell you, you know, I can predict tomorrow's stock market prices based on a bunch of data from today. Look, I did the supervised learning. You know, I think you would be suspicious of me. I think you would think you probably don't have features that could do that. You know, many people have tried, and you know, they, they get arbitraged away. And it, it, you know, we have good reasons to think that's probably not a learnable thing. And so. You know, if, before I came in and started giving the talk, you might have naturally thought that computational complexity would provide that kind of barrier, that there might not be cheaply learnable features that are going to meaningfully correlate with runtimes. You know, it, it would seem like, you know, at least in the worst case, this surely can't work. You know, otherwise, it's, it's kind of an end run around complexity. So, so this has to be making some kind of statement about what these distributions look like on average. It, it's as much a statement about the distributions as it is about the features. And, and so, sure, like any time machine learning is working, people have found features that make sense. But it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that there will always exist such features. Oh, no. I guess what I'm saying is you know, th this turns out to be true in these problems that we've studied. Um, you know, I, I can show you how to do it for SAT. And we've done it for some other problems. I'll, I'll speak later about TSP and MIP. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't have a set of features that work absolutely generically. But I, but I can tell you the kinds of features we use, which give you a sense of how you might approach another problem in, this, in the same kind of way. So, so the most obvious thing that you would think of if you take an undergrad algorithms class, or you know, in your case, taught an undergrad algorithms class, is um, what, what's the size of the problem? So you can say, you know, for SAD, what are the number of clauses? What's the number of variables? What's the clause to variables ratio? You know, what's the length of the binary encoding of your problem? And something like that. Um, 
And I should say, incidentally, I'm going to list a bunch of things. And, and our approach is we use all of them. We expose just like 100, 200 features to the learning algorithm. And we let the learning algorithm sort out which features are useful and which ones are not. So when I'm giving you a bunch of examples, you know, without fail, we used all of the examples. <laughs> Um, so then you can look at kind of syntactic properties of the instance, like what's the, the ratio of positive to negative clauses in the instance. Um, something we found quite fruitful is to look at various constraint graphs that are generated by the instance and then look at sort of superficial graph properties of, of these constraint graphs. So um, it turns out for SAT, there are three natural constraint graphs, one um, with variables and an edge when two variables participate in the same clause. One with two clauses, where there's an edge if those two clauses share a literal with opposite uh, sign. And one with variables and clauses, bipartite graph, and an edge if the variable participates in the clause. Uh, each of these sort of says something different about the constraint kind of structure of the SAT problem. Um, can you say what the factor graph was again? I think I missed that one. Sorry, the, the one on the left? Yeah. Uh, so this is, just, uh, this is actually the easiest one to think about. So this is just saying this variable appears in this clause. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah, I get, I get, I get, I get. Um, and, and so then we can ask you know, all kinds of statistics, like you know, what's an average path length between two randomly chosen nodes, or how um, clustered is the graph, or what, what are the degrees of the variable nodes, or what's the coefficient of variation of the degrees of the variable nodes, and what's the entropy of something. It, all of these kinds of things that can boil down sort of a, um, some, some kind of vector of values into a real number. We tried a bunch of different things like this. Um, Don Knuth has a famous way of estimating the, the search space uh, of, of a, a, a search tree, which basically involves just making random choices. So every time you have a branch, uh, you just flip a coin, and you, just, you run until you get to a refutation. Um, you do this many times, and this gives you an unbiased estimate of the depth of the tree. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, that, then that's, uh, that's a feature that we can use. So, so unlike the other features, this is kind of a statistically estimated feature, because we have to do this for some finite number of samples, but it's tractable for some given finite number of samples. Um, and then we, ha we have some other features that, like this, are sort of estimated features. So we can look at, at heuristic algorithms and um, use something about the heuristic to measure a value. And interestingly, we can actually benefit by doing this even when we reason about other algorithms that are incredibly different that don't use this heuristic at all. This really just tells us a property of the instance. So for example, um, if you know about SAT, you know about something called unit propagation, which is a way of um, simplifying a SAT formula in polynomial time that sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. But if you can, it makes the problem simpler. Question? Yeah. So the search space estimate depends on the algorithm that you're running, right? No. Or should this only depend on the instance? Uh, well, I guess it depends on, on some approach for uh, ordering variables. Um, but, but the point is you can do that for some way of ordering variables. And it gives you a number. And that number is a property of the instance. And I don't have to claim that my algorithm that I'm studying works in that way at all. In fact, I might not know how my algorithm works, because it might be a black box. This is just a way of looking at an instance and getting a number out of the instance that I can use as a feature for my learning. So what is the search tree then here? So I guess I haven't formally defined it to you, but you can imagine various ways that I could define it. I can you know, lexicographically order the variables, and then I can always have you know, tr true be left and false be right. And uh, you know, just for some instantiation of it, I've got a feature. And, and the, the important point is that the feature doesn't have to be tied to the algorithm. So what are the most critical features you find? You that, that's one of the, the questions that I'm, I'm going to dwell on. So, so let, me, uh, let me get to that. Um, so another class of features that we've had some uh, success with is looking at local search algorithms. Uh, again, we might tr be trying to understand the performance of a complete algorithm like uh, KCNFs, but we can nevertheless look at local search heuristics as a way of generating properties of an instance. So we can say something like, um, let me look at the trajectory that a local search algorithm takes within you know, 200 steps or something and say, um, what's the distance between its random starting point and the minimum that it found after it ran for a certain amount of time? Or across uh, several restarts, what's the variation in, in the height of those minima? Or uh, let me look at the first plateau that it hit and the eventual plateau that it hit before I cut it off. And what's the ratio of, of, of depths in the objective function between those two plateaus? Or what's the quality of the best solution that it ever found? So uh, I can ask questions like this. And again, these are just properties in the instance. Um, Finally, I can look at uh, the linear programming relaxation of SAT, uh, which is a terrible relaxation that nobody uses for anything because it isn't very helpful. But of course, SAT has a linear programming relaxation because we can write SAT as a MIP. Um, 
And then we can ask things uh, about the, the variables in the relaxation. We can say things like, what is the norm of, of these um, variables? You know, how, how close are they to, uh, so I can look at like the, the slack vector. I can take every one of these variables. What's that variable's distance from um, 0.5? And then you know if if it's uh, th that'll tell me whether it's close to being integral or not, kind of on average across the instance. So I can do things like that. Does it take you longer to compute heuristics than uh, run the solver? Often. <laughs> so uh, so actually so many of these are okay. This one we rarely use in practice because it is really pretty slow. Uh, it's it's polynomial, but uh, but the constants are are pretty bad in this case. I mentioned this one because it plays a role in what follows, although it's actually otherwise not a very good feature. Um, so you got these features from like literature or? I don't other, use features from what? From other heuristic algorithms or? I use everything that I can ever find. If somebody at a conference tells me a new feature, then I talk to my grad students and we try to get it added. Um, I mean, th there's no reason to be selective about it. And one of my grad students is here, so his heart is sinking as he hears me say this. But it's true. That's where the features came from. Um, and uh, and here's an example of how well we can do. So. Uh, here's again KCNFs on um, uniform random 3SAT, here with um, variable clauses to, ver uh, to variables ratio, I think varying between 3.5 and 5.5. Um, and here on the x-axis is the actual runtime that uh, we ran the solver for. And here on the y-axis is how long we predicted. So this is all on held out test instances that we didn't use for training. So these are all SAT problems that were not seen by our model when we fit it, and we're looking at how well the model does. And uh, this dotted red line is what perfection would look like. Right? We, we can't control whether it varies along the x-axis. That's just how long the algorithm took to run. Um, but if we made perfect predictions, we would be right on the line. And you know, what, what you see here looks like sort of a hot dog on a stick surrounded by a swarm of flies, um, <laughs> which you know, or at least it does to me. I don't know what, what it looks like to you. But uh, you know, essentially, the hot dog part is, is pretty promising, because that, that's a place where we're, we're doing pretty well. And the flies are a little bit less promising because the, the, the variance there is much higher, but at least they're sort of clustered around the hot dog. You know, we don't have a lot of stuff like way out here, which you might think that we would. Um, and overall, I guess I didn't put it on this particular plot, but in terms of root mean squared error, we're doing pretty well here, um, particularly because um, scatter plots kind of hide the fact that we have a lot of density right on the line. Yeah. So the density part is the unsat uh, instances? I yes. So, so this is the unsat instances. Uh, and you can indeed see that, that some but not all of the hot dog is, is the unsat instances, which is good. It kind of makes intuitive sense, because we would think there's lower variance there. It should be more predictable based on what we saw before. And indeed, you know, here we can do a pretty killer job of predicting runtime for unsat. And that's not because all the unsat instances had the same runtime. I mean, notice these guys are taking like a second, and these guys are taking like uh, two minutes. And we're able to tell those apart. Um, so yes, a great intuition there. So where, is the, where are the set of instances that are on the phase transition? Uh, I'll, I'll look at those next. Uh, so this is just varying around the phase transition to begin with. Um, and yeah, and, here, and these are the satisfiable ones looking um, you know, still clustered around the line, but uh, with a lot more variance. Um, so uh, before I go to the phase transition, which I will do, um, Something that we might want to know is uh, the question, in fact, that, that uh, you guys asked before about you know, what features are important to the performance of a model. So you know, at this point in our story, I've shown you a model that, that does a pretty decent job of making predictions. At this point, you know, I, I've made these sort of grand promises to you of understanding something about how the algorithm performs in practice. You might want to see me actually execute on these um, grand promises. And if I show you the actual model that we fit here, it would break your heart it, it, because it's so awful to think about. You know, we have like 100 different features, and we're doing ridge regression, which doesn't force any values to 0. And so it, you know, it tries to make the values be small, but so what? So what I, what I have is a weighted sum of 100 things that are all pretty hard to think about. Uh, and if you evaluate them all together, you work out the little weighted sum, you, you get these pretty accurate predictions. But you know, what are you going to do with this information? It doesn't seem like the starting point for theoretical understanding. Um, and in fact, it's, it's even worse than that, because these features are very correlated with each other often. You know, I didn't do anything to, to control for the correlation of, of one feature with another feature. And so sometimes the weights, you know, if, if some feature has a big weight, that doesn't really necessarily mean it's important. It might just mean that it gets canceled out by a bunch of negative weights on other features that are correlated. So it's really hard to think about you know, anything about what this means. Um, 
So what we have to do if we want to try to understand these things is to winnow things down to a smaller set of features that we can think about as humans. And um, one thing we could do, Tim talked about kind of L1 regularization, where you could sort of hope that the weights get set to zero by doing an L1 fit. Uh, we've tried that, and you, know, you can hope, but it doesn't always work out. So uh, in fact, very often, the, the weights don't, uh, we, we get what Tim described as the bad case, where lots of weights are close to zero and, and not zero. Um, so that, that it doesn't make our models very interpretable. So what we do instead is subset selection. So we just exhaustively try subsets and look at the best small models and see what they give us. And if that becomes intractable, then we do something greedy, where we find the best model of size k, and then we look at all things we could add of size k plus 1 and build up models in that way. Um, so here I'm looking at the relatively simple problem of the um, varying the closet to variables ratio. So one thing I would want to be sure of as a sanity check is that our models discover the importance of this closet to variables ratio. You know, if not, then uh, that would be pretty sad. Um, if so, I'd want to know in what form they depend on it, and I want to know what else is going on. I, I seem to be doing better than, than just looking at the closet to variables ratio, so what else am I benefiting from here? Uh, so here's what we find, sort of following um, the statistics literature, which I, I think it's a bit of a strange thing, but at least when we generated this, we, we followed them. Uh, we show the cost of emission, which is the cost in, um, in loss function, so in root mean squared error, of dropping this feature. Um, with the first one normalized to 100, and everything else um, sort of talking proportionally about how much the cost is. Otherwise, I'd be showing you root mean squared error numbers that would be sort of mysterious. So this just lets you think about percentages. Um, and so what we find is you know, we hard coded in a, a variable of closed to variables ratio minus 4.26, because we're working with linear models. They otherwise wouldn't be able to find a nonlinearity at 4.26. And not too surprisingly, we, we figure out that this is important. Um, then we figure out uh, the next most important thing is a nonlinear relationship in this same uh, quantity because uh, the relationship isn't linear. Um, and then we have another couple of ways in which our model depends on the closet to variables ratio. So, so indeed, we do find that for these variable problems, that's really important. Um, but already in this uh, simple example, we're finding something else that's pretty important. And, um, sort of intriguingly, in our uh, best four variable model, which incidentally is doing pretty close to the performance of the, the overall model, uh, we have the same feature showing up twice in a quadratic feature here. Uh, and this is uh, one of these local search features that I showed you before. So this is um, the feature that looks at what's the best objective function value that a local search algorithm eventually arrives at. Um, so we look at, at uh, uh, the SAPS algorithm, which is a particular local search algorithm. And we're looking at the coefficient of variation in these quantities. So we're asking across many random probes that we run on the local search solver within a second or something, um, how, how much variation is there in the, the quality of the solution that it finds. And although we're, we're trying to characterize KCNFs, which is not a local search algorithm, this variability in, um, in really a very different heuristic, its ability to um, the, the, it, we're not asking even how good is the thing that it finds, but how variable is the thing that it finds turns out to be really informative here. Um, okay, so, so that was uh, all uh, variable ratio stuff. You might think that uh, I was making things too easy for myself. So let's look here at what, what we should expect to be a much harder problem with the uh, fixed ratio data. Uh, we should expect this to be harder because this is, you know, before we knew that the ratio was important and we found out that it was good for us. You know, we planted a clique and we found it. Um, see, see how I did that? Um, no, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But, uh, but, but here, uh, we, we kind of don't know anything, right? We, we, don't, we don't have any additional sort of insights from theory about what might be important. Um, so here's how well we do. Uh, it's less well than before, but uh, in terms of root mean squared error, it's still pretty good. Um, now it looks sort of like a marshmallow exploding, maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, but th this is a place where your eye really betrays you because these sort of single points get sort of magnified. We have a lot of points right here in this space that are, that are not nearly so magnified. We don't really have so much variance um, on average. So, so this is still actually doing um, pretty well. There's still kind of a pattern here. Um, when we dig in, we want to understand what's working here. Of course, the closet to variables ratio no longer shows up as an important feature because we've held it constant. So that has no pr uh, predictive value anymore. Um, now what we find is that features to do with local search solvers are uh, a big part of the story here. So we have this uh, SAP solver, um, uh, some different properties of the performance of the SAP, SAP solver. The thing I identified before uh, is again, oh, and I guess now it's looking at the mean, not the coefficient of variation of that plateau, but that's, that's again turning out to be important. 
And, and here, this ratio between the first plateau and the eventual plateau is also turning out to be important. So all of these are sort of properties of uh, local search solvers. Um, this is the search space size estimate due to Knuth that I mentioned before. And this is um, a degree statistic of the variable clause graph, this factor graph. Um, so um, here's an idea, again, of the, the kinds of things that we can find. You know, what properties of the instance are driving um, the performance of a solver at the transition? Yeah. Do you have some, hind uh, with hindsight, explanation of why the performance of these local search heuristics is so, and, and these quantities about them is so relevant? Uh, I have a bit more to say about that, which, um, which will come in the talk. Um, so I, I don't want to spoil my own punchline. But you can decide at the end whether it's uh, satisfying to you or not. Um, anybody else? OK. Um, so now I'm, uh, I'm switching over to a different solver because you know students graduate and solvers change. And it's very hard to have all the graphs be the same. So, so at this point, we're looking at uh, SATZ, which is a slightly more sophisticated local search, uh, sorry, complete search solver. Um, here again is the performance on um, the variable ratio um, problems. Now you see we're not quite spearing the hot dog quite as well as before. It's kind of falling off the stick, although I've colored it very uh, uh, parsimoniously, I guess. Um, but we see qualitatively we're seeing the same kind of stuff here. Um, so, so now I want to, uh, I think it's actually this is the, the thing that's, that's going to sort of respond to what you had to say. Um, so something that, from the graphs I've been showing you all along, might not come as a surprise, is that if we condition on the satisfiability of the instance, then things get a lot easier. So it turns out I can ask, what if I only look at the unsatisfiable data? What do I need to predict there? What if I look only at the satisfiable data? What do I need to predict there? And it turns out in each case, a single variable model is sufficient. So I didn't show you a single variable model before because it didn't work. It was a really lousy prediction quality. But it turns out something based on local search probing is all you need for thinking about the satisfiable problems. And this search space size estimate is all you need to get a good estimate for the unsat problems. And so my intuition about what was going on in the, the previous slide then is that we're doing some combination of predicting satisfiability status and using these ingredients that are important conditional on satisfiability status. And because it's kind of a mess, um, you, you know, it's a linear model. It's sort of you know, weaved together in a complicated way. But it, it looks like those are the two ingredients that matter. And they matter in a simple way once we condition here. Um, so then you might think, looks like, you know, Leighton Brown, if I don't, if I don't uh, misunderstand you here, you're claiming that you can predict satisfiability status. That sounds pretty crazy. But if, in fact, you could do that, here's something that might be a good idea. You could predict satisfiability status. And then using that prediction, you could uh, reason about these much simpler models, which seem to be much cleaner. And maybe you could get better predictions that way. Now, it's not necessarily the case that this would be a good idea, because the model trained only on satisfiable data does really badly on unsatisfiable data, and vice versa. So this is the sat-only model evaluated on unsat data. And this, um, this is how it does on, oh, sorry, evaluated on everything. And, and this is how it does on the satisfiable data, and this is how it does on the unsat data. Right? So I'm showing you all these pictures that are sort of along the line, and it makes it easy for you to think that every picture in the world would look like that. But this is what a bad picture looks like. Right? It just absolutely didn't get it. Right? It's uh, sort of predicting the same thing for everything, and there's all kinds of variation. And, and likewise, on unsat, you know, we do reasonably well on unsat, and it absolutely blows up on the sat stuff. So, so this kind of approach would make sense if we don't screw up too badly here, because we're going to lose something when we make the wrong choice in the second step. Um, so when we actually put this all together, and uh, there's sort of a mixture of experts story that I could tell about how we make this work properly, we can go from this model, which has got some bias in it, to, to this is uh, predictions on the same data using this kind of hierarchical approach. This is a much better looking prediction. So, so this really does seem to be working uh, better. Did you use the same features to predict satisfiability? Yes, exactly the same features. Um, and because it seems crazy that I could predict satisfiability, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so, so digging in a little bit deeper, we're using a, a, a classifier that predicts a probability to predict satisfiability. And then we use that probability as an input to the regression. So we, we take some kind of um, weights on, on the two different predictions. Um, here's um, how, um, how often we predicted uh, each different uh, probability and how correct we were having predicted it. So you see, when we were pretty sure, we're also pretty right. And when we're pretty unsure, we're flipping a coin. But on the whole, we're, we're right a lot more often than we're wrong, although we're certainly not right all the time. But um, 
this maybe seems a little bit surprising. And this that is... corresponds to 4% of the cases. Pardon me? 0 0.04 means 4% of the cases. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry, I'm so confused about how to read this graph. So like, what is projected probability of sat? There? Okay, so, so this is the output of our classifier. So this is, our classifier says, I am completely sure that this is satisfiable. Oh, okay. Or I am completely sure that this is unsatisfiable. Oh, okay. And then if it's green, the height of this bar is how often did it say that? And if it's green, then that's, um, th that's a case where it was right. And if it's yellow, it's a case where it was wrong. But, 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 if, but, if, but, but it, it, it being right, what does that mean? Because it just gave a probability. How can you say it's right or wrong? Uh, I'm sorry. So if the modal thing that it predicted was correct. Oh, okay. Um, because you know, eventually, that's what we're going to use it for. Yeah, I see, I see. Um, but I guess what I wanted to know is, you know, is, it, is it learning a confidence measure that, that is accurate? Is, is it, does it realize when it doesn't really know? And this is showing that, that that does happen. I should mention that I've just uh, switched things here. So everything up until this point, I've been looking at variable ratio. But of course, this is more interesting in the fixed ratio case. So this graph is about at the phase transition. Um, and so even at the phase transition, we're predicting satisfiability status kind of decent fraction of the time, something like 80% of the time, which seems surprising because we're not using the ratio to do that. This is fixed ratio data. Yeah. Maybe this is your next slide, but what were the main features? Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, I mean, it's, so far the answer again is like it's a mess. This is a, a big, complicated thing. But so, so we dug into this. We, we had a conversation with some theorists, and they threw scorn on our idea, as they should have. Um, so we, we tried to do a much more systematic investigation of whether this was really working, because it, it did seem surprising to us. So. We considered phase transition instances varying from 100 variables, which is super easy. We can solve it in milliseconds. Anything smaller than that, we start worrying that the processor cache has a dramatic effect on the CPU time measurement. Uh, to 600 variables, which is about the biggest thing that you can solve before you, your, your solver never finishes. Um, and what we wanted to know is whether there was an effect in the, the quality of prediction accuracy as we varied from these super easy instances to these really hard instances. Um, and if not, whether we could identify a more easily comprehensible model. Um, and to try to make this all as um, sort of robust as possible, we tied our hands behind our backs in three ways. Um, we trained only on 100 variable problems, which are the super trivial to solve ones. And we had to use that model on the big problems that it never got to train on. Um, we built models consisting only of decision trees with at most two nodes. Uh, so that we would actually be able to look at the model and understand what it was doing. And we emitted all of the probing features um, because they're really effective on the small instances. They can sometimes solve the small instances. And as helpful as they were, they were kind of distracting for us um, because they, there's a less clean theoretical story that can be told about what they're doing. And furthermore, they, they might skew our training on the very simple problems. So we looked only at these kind of graph structure kind of instances. So can you remind us what the probing features are? Well, you'll, you'll, oh, the probing features, sorry, I, maybe I didn't use that word before. That's, these are statistically estimated features. So the search space size estimate and running the local search solvers for a certain amount of time. So most of what has turned out to be useful in the talk so far has been probing features. So I'm not allowing myself to use any of those. I, and it turns out if I don't use them, other things come and take their place, but they're just not quite as good. Um, and so here is an actual model that does pretty well. And here's its classification accuracy across problem sizes. Um, now, the bottom of this, I, I'm not cheating here, the bottom of this is 50%. So this would be random guessing. So anything above is really finding something. Um, now, you know, we did some statistical tests to try to determine whether there seemed to be a trend that this was falling. And we, see we have no statistical evidence for, for a trend that it's falling. You can kind of eyeball it. If anything, the test told us that it might be slowly rising, which um, when you look at it, it does seem a little bit like that. But mostly, it seems just not really to be changing. Uh, and here's the model. I, I can tell you what the model does, because it's this decision tree with only two variables. Um, and, and this model was trained only on these 100 variable problems. Um, so, so here I'm just defining the features in more uh, detail. But something to do with the LP slack of that terrible linear programming relaxation is by far our most useful feature. In fact, almost all of the accuracy of the model comes in the root node there. So, so let me tell you exactly what we do. So we look at SAT's linear programming relaxation. And then for, um, we, we compute this LP slack vector, which is the minimum of 1 minus um, uh, each uh, solution variable and um, the solution variable. So we're looking at, 
um, you know, how close it is to an extremal value. Um, and then we, uh, we take the coefficient of variation of this vector. And so, so that's our, our one feature. And then here we're asking, uh, then th there's a little bit of a, a trick that if I want to be uh, fully formal, I have to tell you about, which is that th all of these values just kind of change as instance sizes grow. So we normalized everything so that features would have mean zero and standard deviation one. Um, that normalization, uh, the normalization required is different at different problem sizes. And so when we evaluate uh, our model on a problem size that it wasn't trained on, we have to estimate the normalization, uh, which we can do without cheating because we're looking at uniform random three sets. So we just generate a whole lot of uniform random three set instances of the appropriate size, um, use it just to estimate the normalization factors for the features. We compute the features on these things many times, figure out how to normalize them, and then use those normalization factors on the one test instance. Um, so that, that's not cheating, but it's a little bit complicated. Uh, and then, so, so that's why these numbers are kind of close to zero, because these are, are mean zero values. So what we're saying is if the LP slack coefficient of variation is a little bit bigger than its mean, one might wonder if it's almost as good just to say zero here, um, then it's probably satisfiable. Um, so the model says, yeah, in that case, it's satisfiable. Otherwise, let's look at the ratio of uh, positive to negative variables. Uh, which is defined like this. I won't walk through all the details, but it's, it's just looking at the syntactic uh, ratio of positive and negative occurrences of, of a variable averaged across variables. Um, and if, um, if, if that, is, uh, that ratio is uh, substantially uh, bigger than the average, then I'll say again that it's satisfiable, and otherwise I'll say that it's unsatisfiable. So that's our whole model. This, this is able, at the phase transition, to predict satisfiability with something like 75% accuracy. Um, so. Why does that happen? I have no idea. Maybe some, some of you will someday tell me. Um, but this is the kind of thing that, that we can use these kinds of methods to find out. And I think something like this is at least a starting point for, for thinking theoretically. Yeah? I just want to say your first uh, stack, it's not as if all the variables are close to integer, right? They could all be close to half, and it would still, that value would still be low, right? That's right. That's right. So, so here we're only looking at the variation. We're not looking. We have other features that talk about the actual values, like the mean of the LP slack, which weren't selected by our model. Uh, you know, we certainly allowed for that to matter. But what it, what it chose to care about is this variation. You tell me, yeah. You use only one feature, like the root feature. Huh? How accurate would you I, I don't have the number, but it's almost as good. Because actually, this leaf is pretty close to 50% accuracy which means that just calling this whole thing unsat is almost the same. Um, because here we're almost random guessing. And so just collapsing the whole thing is almost as good. So if you were to think about it theoretically, I think you'd be fine just to think about only the LP slack feature. Yeah. I think that's doing most of the work. It's certainly much better than random guessing. Um, and of course, I know nothing about the asymptotics here. I just know that you know, scaling up as big as we can scale, we don't see anything happening. Maybe it's tapering off very slowly. You know, again, how, how can I say? Um, OK, how are we doing? Um, I think we're exactly uh, at the point where we should stop. So um, here's our transition. Um, let's uh, come back in half an hour. Thank you. Thank you.